It's Wednesday, September 16, 2020, just after market close in London. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington, joined shortly by our managing editor, Roger Hurst. But first, an unscripted daily briefing with Haley Drasnan. Haley, welcome back. Hey, Ash, good to be here. Haley, what are you looking at today? Retail sales were out this morning, and spending appears to have grown at a slower pace in August than prior summer months. You know, a tepid 0.6% versus the expected 1% uh, the high that that we you know we were, we were planning on seeing. Um, and and I think this highlights the consumer spending patterns that we're seeing. You know, um, the federal relief bill for unemployed people uh, dried up a bit and Americans are spending less, they have less in their wallets. And, you know, that's reflecting this number. And uh, we did, when looking closer at the numbers, did see a boost in um, clothing and furniture in electronics. And I think this might be a result of this like confusing school year that we're starting. Yeah, you know, exactly to your point. So retail sales up 0.6%, consensus range 0.2 to 2.5%. Uh, so toward the lower end of the range, and most intriguingly, perhaps prior month, 1.2%. So roughly a 50% fall off of the rate of increase uh, in the retail sales number from last month. Looking a little deeper into the data, uh, X vehicles, it's a little bit stronger, 0.7%. And, you know, equity markets are up despite these uh, slower retail numbers. And I think it goes to show that the markets aren't so sensitive to economic data as much these days. Um, you know, at the time we're filming this, we're waiting on the Fed and also, you know, investors in the coming weeks are waiting to see for another stimulus package out of Congress. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's even too, you're putting it too charitably, uh, Hallie. It's the markets are just totally disconnected from anything that seems to be happening with the real economy. It's this juxtaposition we've been covering between the real economy and the markets that, you know, we'll continue to cover uh, in the coming months. Yeah, that's exactly right. Haley, what else are you looking at? So more on the U.S. equity market. You know, we're seeing a surge in IPOs this week. Take Snowflake, for example, the cloud-based data company. Uh, it, it debuted today and more than doubled its opening price, uh, I think, at $245, $245. It, um, it, it shared um, and it was listed at $120. So um, incredible to see that investors want more high-growth stocks than the things that have uh, rallied so far this year. Yeah, so obviously we're recording here at about 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, so some time left before the end of the trading day. Your mileage may vary. It's hard to believe given the pandemic, but 2020 is proving to be one of the biggest money raising years for new issues since the tech boom, you know, 20 years ago. And I think a lot of it has to do with this new Fed policy and the idea that there are very few places for investors to park capital outside of equities. And, you know, companies really seem to be racing to IPO under this premise. Yeah, I think that's a really great metaphor. We've talked about this before. This does harken back to the tech boom when I was one of the young guys on Wall Street. You know, just reading through, doing a little bit of research on Snowflake coming in here, it really is like a, a checklist of all of the buzzwords we had. Let's see, we got AI, we got big data, data lake, data exchange, cloud, cloud compute, software as a service, services revenue. It really does check every box in in this uh, particular uh, this particular domain of stocks that are hot. It, look, it's important to realize that this is a story that's very different uh, than uh, Nikola, which we talked about yesterday. Uh, you know, last year the company uh, revenue rose 174 percent to 265 million dollars, so over a quarter of a billion dollars in revenue, uh, fastest uh, growing business application. Uh, in 2019, according to data from Okta, uh, they're raising three and a half billion dollars, total valuation of 33 billion. And I think one of the more intriguing factors that has gotten market attention is Warren Buffett, who has historically been allergic to tech stocks, has been allergic to companies that he doesn't understand, is investing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into this company. Yeah, it's amazing. Snowflake's CEO is selling half of his 8 million shares to Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. And as you said, you know, this typically isn't in Buffett's playbook, so it's definitely making it attractive. Yeah. It's an interesting story, too. Look, I don't want to get too far over my skis here. It's been a long time since I've been in the tech space. But the company does something that's really interesting. You know, effectively, what they're doing is they're doing cloud database services uh, that make uh, that allow for more uh, for, for, for more virtualized uh, data analytics. And, and basically what that means is they're disaggregating the uh, data layer from the compute or analytics layer, and they're framing it in a way so that you can, uh, you can get more software, uh, more hardware, analyzing and churning through this data. Uh, so it is very much 
uh, a very kind of 2020 story. Yeah, and it's interesting. Not a lot of competition except Oracle and Amazon's Redfish. I would be willing to bet that Mr. Bezos and Mr. Ellison are going to be investing more capital in this space very shortly. As I always say, we'll keep our eye on it. Well, there's a lot to keep an eye on. Haley Drasnan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ash. Roger Hurst, welcome back. Hi, oh, Ash. Good to, good to be here. It's been a few weeks. It has. I think two, maybe three weeks. And it's been quite a dramatic couple of weeks in, in many ways, at least in the U.S. equity market. Yeah. Roger, exactly to that point. The three things that have been on my mind, options, options, options. You know, you've been so eloquent in explaining this on the Refinitive channel uh, that's partnered with Real Vision. And I thought that this would be a great opportunity to have you unpack a little bit about how you see the world and how the fundamentals of this market work. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, everyone talks about the the options whale. Um, and I think that the whale of SoftBank has been um, perhaps less of a, an influence. It's certainly been in there, but it's maybe been a follower um, rather than the driver. And, and I've called it the, it's the retail. It's been the megalodon of the market, so the retail meg. They've been the real drivers of this. And they've been driving. I mean, it's been incredible size. I mean, you know, we've seen the notion of options has got to 140% of the cash market. Three years ago, that used to be around about 40%. So these are huge numbers. But what's been really fascinating is that the size of the options contracts have generally been under 50 lots. Mm. So 50 lots is 5,000 shares. Um, so 100 shares per contract, 50 lots is 5,000 shares or under. So they've been trading little and often. Whereas the options whale, um, it looks like they were doing largely call spreads and often doing them delta neutral because I think they were selling out of stock positions and buying call spreads. So if you're doing that, you're having less impact on the direction and also you're having less impact on the absolute volatility. But the retail guys, they've been in size, they've been buying calls, which means they're buying volatility. And because of the market makers who are selling them the calls have to buy the stock as a hedge, they've been pushing the market up. So there's been this options-led equity exuberance. But I think the other thing that I've been talking about is that it still feels like this is an unwind or it's a, an exuberance on the upside and an unwind of exuberance to the downside, but it's basically an air pocket. And as yet, nothing obviously structural in what we're seeing. It's really dominated by those equities, in particular, options on seven mega cap tech stock, which are driving all that volume. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. You know, I find this absolutely fascinating. The real whale, or as you put it, the megalodon, uh, isn't uh, one particular institutional investor. It's your friends and neighbors who are actually participating uh, in the option space in a way that they haven't in the past. But I want to jump to hearing you explain the significance and the and the and the mechanisms that this market worked by, because you've done such a great job on this. You mentioned Delta. We talked a little bit uh, off camera uh, in past about uh, about Gamma. Explain how these Greeks work uh, and what the impact is uh, on a relative and absolute basis to the U.S. equity market. So the you know, what these guys are doing is they're tending. The majority of what they're buying is are options with less than two weeks to expire. So an options contract is a bit like insurance. You can buy insurance for a year. Once it runs out, you have to renew. Well, these are options that only have two weeks to run. And we've got the big, the big expiries actually on Friday of this week. So you know you have these triple, you have the quarterly expires, which are uh, March, June, September, December, with the big volume. So what what generally happens is that you get closer to that expiry. The you know the natural thing is that gamma picks up. If you've got you know if this is expiry, if you're at the money then the gamma required increases as you go to expiry. And the reason behind that is that you know, if you're two months away or two, more than two weeks away, you buy an at-the-money option. So stock is at 100, strike it as 100. You probably have to have a 50 delta hedge. But let's say you're on the day of expiry. Now, this is an extreme example. As a market maker who sold that call, if it's at 101, you have to deliver all the stock. If it's at 99, you have to deliver nothing. So if that stock starts moving around, the market maker perceive, conceivably have to buy 100, sell 100, buy 100, sell 100. In reality, they don't do that. They manage themselves where they might, they might pin the stock above or below the strike. But anyway, that's the gamma that picks up. Now, what we've been seeing is this upward pressure as we got close to the September expiry, as we move through these strikes, as you get close to the strikes, close to expiry, the number of stocks that you have to buy per unit of underlying increases and increases. And it sort of goes like this, like this, like this, and that goes boom straight through. And Raoul used to call these the gamma hammer. You buy these positions and it would wham through. And this was a kind of you know a great way of playing these opportunities. At the end of 1999, myself and Raoul were doing this. 
And we saw it in the French market, which expired at the end of the year, whereas everything else was at third Friday. And for what that, the French market, when everyone's away, we saw it happening into the end of 99. So that's what we've been seeing here. But it's been led by these retail guys buying these, just buying long calls, not hedged. Market maker sells a call, buy some stock against it. And as the market moved up, they had to buy. And it all works in reverse. You eventually go blast through all your gamma, blast through all your hedges, runs out of steam, loses momentum and reverses, and then the same thing happens in reverse, which is what we've been seeing for the last two weeks. I think a lot of this will disappear after the September expiry. This is the triple witching, quadruple witching in the US, where you get index options, single stock options, um, are options on, on the futures, although there's no volume there, and the futures themselves all expire either in the morning in the index level or a single stock at the end of the day. And it happens in Europe as well. Yeah. I mean, the mechanics of the way this works are so crucial to understanding the market and the gyrations that we've seen. Uh, you know, as you said, it increases volatility uh, around particular uh, expiry periods uh, that have nothing to do with, you know, anything that's fundamental, for example, with earnings uh, or with macroeconomic fundamentals. Yeah. And we've seen this before. I mean, the, you, know, you may recall back in March, and again, I never made any predictions. So before someone says you didn't say that, I said there is, you've got to watch for expiries because you get inflection points regularly. When you get a big move into and around an expiry, you often get an inflection point. And at the time I said, look, remember, the low of December 2018 was the first trading day after the December expiry, which was Christmas Eve. The low of the March um, sell-off, COVID sell-off, was a day after the March expiry. It was, the expiry was on the 21st, the second, the third, Monday the 24th, sorry, it was the 20th, Monday the 23rd was the low, we had the package from the Fed as well, but that was also a low. A week and a half before the June expiry, we had the 5% air pocket. Two weeks before this expiry, we just had a 10% air pocket on the NASDAQ. They, they should be critical to people's thinking. They don't define the direction, but they can accelerate the direction of a market in both directions because of the inventory management that has to go on around them. So I always just say, look, you know, be aware that we're coming up to one and we've got the, March, the, the September expiry on Friday of this week. That will, we've probably seen a lot of the gamma now moving out of the market. The shortest dated options really now are one month from here, so the October, uh, October expiry. So it just changes that dynamic a little bit. Yeah, and talking of the air pocket, Roger, you were ahead of the curve on that. And for viewers who watched the Refinitive show, uh, they got that ahead of when it actually happened in terms of your, uh, I don't want to call it a forecast, but your analysis uh, of what had potentially been lurking beneath the surface. Uh, it was pure pure luck, obviously, because we we go out once a week, and the week the day we go out is normally a Wednesday. We went out Tuesday this week, and it happened that the Wednesday was the day before the sell off kicked in. But we actually said the week before that we'd said, look, we can see that data usage is ridiculously low. People are away from their desks. Implied volatility is very very high. The market realized volatility was very very low. So volatility was expensive, driven by two things: retail buying it. But also, as we're getting closer and closer to the election, you know, you've got this incredible bump in the VIX curve. Five months ago, you're a long way out. But as you get closer, you're moving up the curve. So the October VIX future is currently around about 30. So when September expires, we roll on to October, VIX will go up again just because we're going up that curve. So those were really driving. And I just said, look, this, this is a, an air pocket waiting to happen. I don't think it'll be a structural move. I think it will be an air pocket move. And that's what we've got. And you know, on the other side of this, the other bit of this is obviously the options whale. But the options whale has been buying these call spreads. So you buy, let's say you've got a strike of 100 again. They're buying the 105. They're selling the 110. The 105 might need, um, you know, might need a 20 delta hedge. And the 110 might need a 5 delta hedge. You've got a 15 delta. It's a smaller delta. It's less impact on the market. If they're selling the stock against it anyway, it's neutral. And then there's only a small amount of vol impact. So I don't think they're having the big impact here. I just think it's the retail. And they're just doing it in this incredible size. I mean, they've, you know, they've got the momentum trade. They've got the wind behind their backs. And they're doing it. And I think it's sort of, you know, it's an exuberance. But I don't think there's a structural risk because they're playing it from the long side. Yes, they might be using all their savings. Yes, they might even be using leverage, which would be a bit of a worry. If you're long premium, right. you can only lose your premium and no more. It might be all your savings, but that's all you can lose. Roger, you just mentioned that you didn't think that this was anything more than really an air pocket in the market. Why do you think that? There's a couple of things um, at this stage. The first one was that um, when we look at something like credit spreads, now the credit market is obviously being deformed by the activists of the central bank who are buying uh, corporate bonds. 
But when I looked at something like the five-year um, credit swap, so this is the index, it's got a nice little sort of coincidental pattern with the VIX. When we saw the VIX going up with this latest move, so we did see vol picking up a little bit, VIX spiked, but the credit derivative um, index didn't. And now VIX has gone up and it's moved back down again. So there wasn't a big threat coming from the credit market. Now, the, this, the problem with this is that the credit market's not giving good signals because it's a deformed market by the central banks. Then the second element to it all though, as well was that we could look at HYG, uh, which is the high yield ETF, and LQD, which is the investment grade one. And those peaked and then have been flatlining for actually more than a month. The S&P had been, again, following that in the recovery and then had this spike up in the last kind of the two weeks before the air pocket and the air pocket back down. So again, the S&P went through a round trip whilst the high yield and the investment grade did nothing. And then the third thing is vol of vol. And this is the key thing, which is volatility of volatility. So options on the VIX, volatility of volatility. When things get really hairy, often the volatility of volatility really goes up. And that's when you have these structural short positions. And we had that in Volmageddon in 2018. There was a massive short vol, structural short vol position, yield enhancement. When that moved, when the market moved, vol of vol exploded higher. Over the next two years, it built up again. So that when we had the March implosion, vol of vol exploded higher. This time around on this move, vol of vol has been very, very well behaved. It hasn't moved aggressively. And again, it's because this market has been driven by the retail from the long side buying options, driving the market up, driving volatility up, plus that election impact. And you can see this with Apple. Apple price up, the Apple VIX, A-A-P-L-V-I-X on, on Bloomberg, for instance, moved up as well. And then when Apple sold off, Apple VIX sold off because people are now locking in their profits and selling options. So again, it shows you that there's not that massive structural short that can often unwind positions. You know, 1987, people sold puts all the way up. So when the market collapsed, those puts got blown out and you had unlimited losses. This time around, it's being driven from the long side where as long as they're not using leverage in their margin account to buy the premiums, they're limited to losses on those premiums only. So it's, the structure is less critical. I still think the next phase of the market is the structural one on insolvency. Yeah. We might get the insolvency, but if the market is saying no problem because the credit spreads are still very, very well behaved, then you know, we haven't got a structural problem yet. So, Roger, when you talk about the risk of insolvency, what are, what are you looking at uh, as a future proxy of whether or not that may be on the horizon? Well, I mean, ultimately, it is. It's the credit market, you know. It's but that's a big, large cap credit market. Now, can you have? Well, let me put it another way: the big one of the big issues that I have for the long term health of this market is that large cap companies that should be going under are not going to go under because their bonds are going to be bought by the central bank through. QE, um, and you know, we know that they're buying corporate bonds, mortgages, and, and government bonds. But the smaller end of the market, you know, the mama and papa businesses, small private businesses, restaurants, they're all going under. So we're seeing a pickup in insolvency at the micro level, but we're seeing an impact or a pickup in zombie companies at the large cap level. Both of these are bad. Eventually, if you have real problems at the micro level, it will feed through to even lower revenues at the macro level, but continue to buy their corporate bonds from the central banks or potential of it, credit spreads, the market is not giving us a negative signal. If, however, the problem with the Fed is that the Fed told us they were going to buy them, mm. go classic you know, bluff, the market then bought them. So we're now where we are in terms of tightness of credit and where we are in high yield and investment grade. If real trouble kicks in, the market will sell all its inventory to the Fed, who will use up its 2.3 trillion on buying back from the market. Then it'll have to do another 2.3 trillion because we're now back down again. So that's the never ending cycle that we get into, but that's not happening just yet. The problem that we've got is a pickup in zombies. It's happening in Europe, it will happen in the US, which means the more zombies you have, the worse future growth will be, the lower the velocity of, of capital, or at least the, the, the misallocation of capital will continue. And therefore, we'll still have the same problems in five years' time of no growth. Probably no inflation that we really want. We'll still have asset price inflation, but not economic inflation, true growth. Yeah, Roger, talk a little bit more about these zombie companies. Obviously, the idea that these companies need bailouts uh, in order to function, they're, they, it, 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 they're not functioning in an economically efficient way. Uh, it creates all kinds of structural imbalances in the economy. How do you think about that, and what are you watching? So it's, it's just a low-growth story. It's basically... 
what we want with capital is we want capital to find or what, what we want for a strong economy is we want capital to find productive means or, or you know look for innovation look for productivity gains but we're in a world where if you're looking at a world where yields and growth expectations are subdued and when we look at things like inflation expectations so five year five years so i've talked about these before i think it's f w i s u s five five in the us and similar in europe they went down obviously they come back up to roughly where they were before but the problem is those are still low levels if you as an investor think that there's no growth for the next 10 years but you see the equity market going up 10 percent every year you do right. buy banks, you take your money and you don't go into you don't put it into productive capital you don't use it sensibly or well, actually you do use it sensibly because you can get money but you can the share buybacks is where you're you're doing well but it means there's no capital being put into future growth. So future growth remains benign. So we roll on, we've basically thrown a whole bunch of capital away again. We're at the same position that we were in 2008, in March of this year. Who knows when it'll be, maybe it's already starting. But what we wanna see is, are, are we going to see, or can we have unlimited support? What is the tenacity of fiscal plus the central banks? Is it QE infinity? Is it fiscal infinity, i.e. is it MMT? Or is there a point where they go, you know what, well, okay, this is death by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts could be months or years in the making. So it's a slow process. You really want to look at, at the credit spreads, but the credit spreads are being artificially held down by the central banks. Right. That's very well said, Roger. And it's it exists at a couple of different levels. You know, as you said, it's productive at the microeconomic level for the investor in terms of a productive use of capital. Uh, but in the broader sense, what you have is massive misallocation of resources. You have uh, the productive uses uh, of the economy not being funded properly, and you have zombie companies uh, that are sucking out the capital that could be spent uh, effectively building a more productive uh, and uh, and and in in some senses a more just uh, economy for the future. Yeah, I mean, you want, you know, we've got banks that are too big to fail that are regulated um, to buggery, but at the same time are protected. But we've got fintech coming through. More importantly, we've got other you know digital forms of capital and currency coming through as well, which should be disrupting it much more quickly. But they're being kept alive. And you know what banks should have done over the last ten years is invest in technology, but none of them did, which right. is why the value propositions where you can't unlock the cap can't unlock the value. And this is happening across the board in a lot of the old world economy stocks. And the most classic one is where you had a lot of the um, the classic value stocks, which had debt added to them by private equity, who then pulled out dividends to increase their own cash flow, at the same time saddled these guys with loads of debts, and they're in parts of the economy which weren't growing particularly rapidly. You want these companies to go under. I don't mean it in a nasty way because you don't want to see um, you don't want to see people lose their jobs. But it's a bit like the UK mining industry. It was protected, protected, protected. There was massive strikes in the early eighties. They right, were being right. subsidized by the rest of the UK because they were non-profitable. And we didn't want to, you know, there's this thing, we don't want these mining communities, working class communities to be broken up. But they unfortunately needed to be broken up so that the UK could move on and become productive again, rather than throwing money away onto industries that were inefficient. Right. And that's what we have. You've got inefficient industries, you need creative destruction, you rejuvenate and you come out with new technology. But if no one's, you know, if no one's, if new technologies can't compete with old technologies which are being given unlimited capital because they can tap these ridiculous capital markets where anyone wants a yield of 25 basis points over treasuries, so 1%, then they continue for a long time and they don't, their day of reckoning doesn't come. Look at Japanese banks. They yeah. should have blown up in the 90s, but they're still just muddling along here 30 years later. Yeah, it really is a paradox. You know, I'm reminded many years ago uh, when Microsoft was the most innovative and cutting edge tech company uh, on the West Coast, uh, Bill Gates uh, was asked in an interview if he was worried about what IBM was going to do or DEC or uh, one of the old world behemoths. And he said, absolutely not. I worry about what is going to be created in the garage. I worry about the the twenty something year old folks who are going to be uh, who are going to be innovating me out of business, and that's absolutely proven to be the case. Uh, and and this challenge of zombie companies, uh, you know, in effect, uh, has the ability uh, to suck the capital away from the most innovative and productive uses of the economy. Uh, although I guess you could argue that VC has stepped in to fulfill that role. Uh, but it is very much a paradox and a challenge, and how you deal with uh, the impact 
that this disruption, the creative destruction that Joseph Schumpeter called it, uh, has on the lives of individuals and communities? There really are no easy answers. No, we've got to always rejuvenate. We've got to, we've always got to hope that we can push forward. Now, a lot of this is clearly demographics as well. So that's part of the mix. The demographics are peaking. Then, you know, things like you know, GDP growth, which is mainly a function of demographics and a bit of productivity. Well, if you don't have the demographics and the productivity is flatlining, then you're going to struggle. And effectively, that's where we were. We, we got overladen, overladen, overburdened with debt as what we're trying to do is maintain a rate of change of the standard of living. And the rate of change of the standard of living reached its natural conclusion and was replaced with debt to keep it going. Right. So effectively, if we could have a concept, it's a ridiculous concept in a way, but um, a natural rate or an optimal rate of demand, it's organic, well, we went beyond that through using debt. Problem is, once you start down that route, if you stop adding more debt, you feel worse off because it's all relative. The rate of change of standard of living peaks and rolls over, so we add yet more debt. And we've got ourselves locked into this system now where we actually would like what we should have is a cost of capital that's freely floating, which is not if you've got QE or yield curve control, which are sort of two versions of the same thing. We don't know where capital should be. Probably interest rates should be higher, but we're now in a system which can't deal with higher interest rates because there's so much debt. So we're locked in it. Yeah. You know, demography, standard of living, uh, productivity. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about what's happening with Brexit. So it's back on the cards again. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it was never going away, but you know, like everything else, COVID has been just all so, well, all consuming that is taken a back seat. But now we, we're, you know, we've, we've got a very, very limited time, uh, time frame. We've got to have a deal agreed by the 15th of October, ratified by the 31st of December. And it's looking like there's a chance of, I call it a clean Brexit because you know, I, I don't want to, I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit here, but you often hear about people falling out of, of Europe and there's negative connotations. The reality is that if we have no deal, it's a clean Brexit, it's, we're on our own. Now that is normally where, you know, when we've been pricing this before, and this is purely taking a view on the market. But it's looked like we're getting a deal. We've been up in the 130s on sterling, and it looks like we're going to fall out, clean Brexit. We're more like 120. We we're 134 about a week ago. We got down to 127-ish. So the market's pricing it in. The risk reversal. This is buying puts on sterling versus dollar. Massively increased two and a half vol points over the last two weeks. And if you look at sterling volatility versus G3 volatility again. Very, very big spike in sterling versus um, the others. So we're starting to price in the chance that um, we have a clean Brexit. And to add into the mix as well from that is that one of the big arguments for why Brexit, why we get a deal is that places like Germany um, export so much to us, they don't get a deal, G Germany will be upset. Problem is, with the COVID crisis, German exports to the UK have fallen off a cliff over the last six months. So they've already had a dry run. Germany knows what it's like to not export so much to us. So there's less urgency for Germany to demand that the rest of Europe falls in line with a deal because of German exports. So I think there's a, you know, there is now a much, much bigger risk that we get a clean Brexit. But I'm not so bothered about that because the great thing about having sovereignty over your currency in a world where volumes look like they could fall further is that you can adjust your currency. Right. So yes, if sterling falls to 120 or below, it has inflationary impacts for the UK, which imports quite a lot, and that will hit, unfortunately, certain parts of the poor, poor parts of the population again. But the UK currency is an adjustment function, and in right. times of adversity, you want that. Europe doesn't have that. Italy can't do that. We right. can. So I'm, I'm looking and thinking, okay, well, you know, if we go to parity versus the dollar. Rather than go, oh my God, we're a weak country, you could actually say, well, we've got an adjustment mechanism. And there's going to be a point where people go, God, dollar parity with sterling, euro parity with sterling. Every asset in the UK now looks cheap. Let's pile in. Yeah. self regulating mechanism. So I'm kind of, is it going to be worse than what we had during the COVID crisis? No. And I think that's why the UK and the press and everybody is a little bit sort of not that bothered because. It's not going to be as worse as being locked down for three months. Roger, can I get a better deal on an apartment in London than in New York? Is that possible? Not at the moment, because London prices have not fallen quite so dramatically. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're falling, but they're not falling that much. 
it's um you know london at the end of the day and i, I was back in there last i had two days in there definitely the trip in and out a lot more people still the city of london is incredibly quiet still remarkably so once you get out of the financial district there's there's a bit of life to the old you know old lady at the moment so you know things are picking up interesting roger i'm so glad you brought up the city of london um in in reference to brexit you have obviously very a deep and wide network of connections in the city of London from your days in banking uh, at Deutsche Bank, at Goldman Sachs, and others. What's the pervasive feeling uh, among people who are working in the financial services community about where we are right now in Brexit? What's the unofficial word that you hear when you're sitting in a pub? It's, I think it's almost sort of the, the, the risk or the likelihood that we just leave is going up. I mean, there's all, there's all the shenanigans about um, going back on the laws or the, the legal aspects that we'd all agreed. Mm. But I just think that there is, you know, there's, there was Brexit fatigue already. There's now COVID fatigue. There's almost this, I think there's this sort of general feeling that it won't be so bad either way because of what we've been through. So for people who you know, really wanted the clean version of Brexit, it's got a lot, lot higher chance of happening. And I think there's going to be fewer people against it because... Is it really worse than what we've experienced through the COVID scenario? So that's really, I think, is really driving it. And I think it's kind of, you know, let's, let's move on. There are worse things to worry about now. Yeah, interesting and very well said. Roger, final thoughts as you look uh, at this complex landscape, volatility, COVID, Brexit. What are you going to be looking at as you go forward? Uh, and how are you thinking about that future? So I'm still looking at the same things I've probably mentioned every time we've come on, which is, the dollar's moved, and the dollar's moved versus the euro and G10, but primarily against the euro. And the euro moved, remember, it moved higher, 112 to 120 on the back of agreeing the deal. This was a euro story. Normally, when the dollar's on the back foot, it's led by emerging market currencies, which have a higher beta. Emerging market currencies diverged from the euro G10 currencies as well. And I'd still like to see, if, if, we're, gonna, if we're really going to see dollar weakness, the EMFX have to join that party, strength in the MFX. But we're still seeing a lot of these currencies on the back foot. I know Turkey has lots of idiosyncratic problems, but it's like in 2008, there was an idiosyncratic problem in Ireland, in Iceland, in Portugal. You know, <laughs> but they're all the same thing in the end. They were just different manifestations of the same issue. So that could still happen. So I'm still looking at that. And I think that you know, we started to see the European policymakers worrying that the Europe 120 is bad. We've got problems, or Europe is at flat inflation, CPI zero versus the US getting a bit. So how do they hit that? They're going to, to worry. Problem for Europe is they, they burnt, you know, they, they've shot their bolt on the package. They've just got the frugal five to agree. They're not going to get another big package now. And there's not much more they can do on the, the monetary side apart from, oh, we're going to double down on QE. But that's the area. It's the currencies, and that's the, the big escape valve. You've got corporate bonds that are being, um, you know, corporate bonds are being bought up by central banks. If government bonds are being bought up by central banks, if equities in Japan are being bought up by central banks, you don't have many um, re release valves. Currency is the one where we can probably see it. It's still being manipulated. You know, they don't want Europe to go too far, but it's the currency is where we can still see that. And I think that for Europe, it will become a problem if the euro strengthens too much. There's probably a little bit more upside, maybe. But I think we, again, these things balance themselves out. I'm not a massive, um, as not as bullish on the dollar as I was, but I'm not massively bearish because Japan and Europe can't let their currencies strengthen too much because it'll massively impact their policies, which is print, 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 get inflation by weakening the currency. Uh, that's, that's just, it's going to balance itself out. But watching the currencies, that's the release valve on the macro front when everything else is being impacted by central banks intervening in those markets. Roger, an important point and great insight as always. Thanks for joining us. No problem at all. Thanks for having me.